I heard about AMS first in, in 1994, but then I hesitated to, to join this because this uh, sounded like a very ambitious uh, endeavor. And then finally, I joined uh, the collaboration in 1996 and then became really involved uh, in, in, in 2000 when I was moved to, uh, to University of Geneva and took over the role of the uh, project leader at University of Geneva. Well, the main challenge is that we take uh, technology that we are used to from accelerator experiments and we transport it into outer space. Uh, that is a challenge because the environment in space is really hostile. Uh, first of all, during the, uh, the, the, the rocket launch, the vibrations are almost deadly. It's uh, about co corresponding to 9G, nine times the acceleration of, of Earth. Uh, that's like jumping out of the window on the third floor and not getting hurt. Then second, in orbit itself, uh, there is, a, there is a, a, a hostile radiation, which we are after, but which also irradi irradiates the, uh, the instrument itself. Uh, there's very large uh, uh, temperature differences between shadow and sunlight of several hundred degrees. And there is uh, micrometeorites that bombard the experiment at all times. So it's very difficult to uh, take high technology into space. Cosmic rays have been discovered about 100 years ago. It is particles that are produced by star explosion in, in, in its vast majority, uh, then are somehow mysteriously accelerated and directed towards us. There's a lot of uh, this radiation that comes on the Earth's surface. It's about uh, several hundred per square, square meter per second. So it's not a small effect. It's a, it's a major ingredient to the environment of the Earth. It has something to do probably with uh, genetic modifications. It has something to do with the climate. It has a lot of implications for us. And uh, this means that we must absolutely know more about it than we do today. Well, luckily enough, uh, the Earth's surface is very much protected against cosmic rays by the atmosphere. Uh, so we don't get irradiated very much by, by cosmic rays just because the atmosphere protects us. That also means that it absorbs cosmic rays and you cannot really observe them uh, on the Earth's surface. So you have to go at least into a balloon, if not into space. So the further you go out, the better it is. Uh, the ISS is the ideal platform for large experiments. And AMS is a large experiment. It is about three meters wide, uh, four meters high weighs seven tons, so it's not uh, the usual satellite size. So the ISS is the ideal platform. It can also supply the, uh, uh, the electric power that the experiment needs, which is in fact quite limited. It's about 2,000 watts. Hubble is, a, is an instrument that sees light from stars. Uh, it is a telescope in the classical sense. It is, it is something that detects photons, light, f uh, emitted by, uh, by cosmic phenomena. We see charged particles emitted by cosmic phenomena. That is not exactly the same thing, but the, uh, the, uh, there is a link between the two because whenever you uh, accelerate a charged particle, it, it will emit light. So we are looking at the two edges of the same phenomena. Uh, Hubble, for example, looks at another telescope, look at the acceleration process itself, and we look at the end product, the accelerated particle. It's organized exactly the same way as the experiments are at CERN. Uh, there's no formal hierarchy. Uh, we just discuss until we find a solution. And the reason why this works for us and maybe doesn't for others is that uh, we are the only victims of our mistakes. Uh, that is a very strong organizational principle. If you yourself are the one to suffer from the mistakes that you make, then you are very much more careful not to make them. So that is the organizational principle. It's a, it's, it's a, a, a great success all over in science. And I think that uh, politicians should take an example from this. Well, I will surprise you because I, uh, we are looking at very solid, uh, almost down-to-earth uh, uh, physics on one side and very exotic phenomena on the other side. So let's start by the, by the, by the solid ones uh, where we really know what we are looking at. That is making a catalog of all the cosmic rays that come in over a long period of more than a solar cycle so that we can distinguish all of the various sources, uh, classify them, uh, know exactly what they are, know exactly what their properties are. That is sort of the groundwork of a, of, a, of a scientist, right? But then, of course, the reason why we do this is not to find our prejudice um, uh, comforted, but that we are looking for unusual phenomena. Unusual phenomena would be particle production by dark matter, 
particle production by little uh, res residues of antimatter that might be hidden somewhere in our galaxy. Uh, or new forms of, of matter altogether, like uh, this, this uh, mysterious thing that people call a strangelet, which would be uh, 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 matter made by very heavy quarks. Dark matter is a, a, a very mysterious phenomenon. We know it is there because we see the gravitational action of dark matter all around the galaxies. Practically every galaxy that we know about has a halo of dark matter around it that does not emit light, so it's not visible by telescopes, but it is visible by the motion of, of, uh, of objects around, uh, around the galaxy. Now, we, we have no idea what it consists of just because it doesn't emit light. So the traditional way of, uh, of observing cosmic phenomena is just not working for this kind of, uh, uh, of, of matter. So what, what AMS will be looking at is uh, secondary effects that have to do with maybe self-annihilation of dark matter particles with themselves. When they collide, they may produce uh, a charged particle. They may produce antiparticles also, and that is uh, what we are after. For all we know, in the beginning of the, of the universe, at the Big Bang, matter and antimatter have been uh, equally created. Now, for some mysterious reasons, antimatter seems to have disappeared because the Earth, the solar system, our galaxy, uh, even the cluster of galaxies that we live in is, is for the vast majority made of matter, not antimatter. So somehow, half of the universe has mysteriously disappeared. We would like to know whether there's any left at all there may be none left, and we will know that uh, after the end of this experiment. We will know if or not there are small amounts of antimatter left. If there aren't, then the world becomes even more interesting because then we have to find a mechanism which has made antimatter disappear at the profit of matter. So to make both of them disappear, that's easy. But to just make one of them disappear is not easy. You have to have an objective difference between matter particles and antimatter particles. That's ingredient number one. Ingredient number two is that matter must disappear. We have never seen an electron disappear. We have not seen a proton disappear either, even though we have really looked. So for all we know, the lifetime of these particles is longer than the lifetime of the universe. So we don't know how they have disappeared. And the third one is that you have to find a mechanism which is out of equilibrium such that you don't recreate all the antimatter that you have just made disappear. So these are three ingredients that have been already uh, found out by, by Sakharov um, uh, uh, almost a, tw two or three decades ago. So we are still after all of these ingredients. The only thing we know is that there is indeed uh, a, a very, very tiny and, uh, and, uh, and uh, um, subtle difference between matter and antimatter that is for specialists is called CP violation, and that we know that it exists, and that is the only ingredient of the three that we know exists. Well, on one, on one hand, I am uh, uh, happy that it, that it will, in fact, be launched. I'm uh, not nervous about the proper functioning of the instrument itself, uh, we have done. We have invested every care that is possible so that it will survive the uh, the, the, the rocket launch. It will work uh, uh, as we have planned on the ISS. But of course, there is always risks in spaceflight. Uh, we have seen that with the space shuttle program. Not all of them have. Uh, the, all of them have been successful. There have been even tragic accidents. So uh, this risk exists. One must accept it if one wants to to experiment in space, and we accept it. But that, of course, means that we are looking forward with uh, a lot of confidence in the technology, but on the other hand, uh, with a lot of nervousness also.